morning. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church this morning. We're glad you're joining us. Uh, I hope you're doing well. I want to remind you that we love you, and so does God, even more importantly so. Uh, letting you know real quick here, just in the way of some announcements, uh, if you have a need, if there's something we can help you with in any way, if you're not able to get to the store to get groceries or however it may be, please feel free to contact us. Give us a call here at the church or text us on our phones or uh, contact us through Facebook, however you can do it. Uh, but let us know. We want to be a blessing to you in this time of need. I want to thank our worship team for coming out and putting this together. I think you're going to enjoy this and be blessed by it, okay? Uh, a few announcements. I uh, would also like to remind you that this is going to be uploaded to our to our website, calvary.love. You'll be able to find a link to go to the YouTube page, but it's calvary.love. Uh, look for that. Look for it also on Facebook, too. You can find it there as well. Because of the coronavirus, because of all the things that are going on right now, we are have had to cancel all of our outside activities. And by outside, I mean any extracurricular activities that we're doing. We want to abide by what the government's asking us to do and want to help this thing to come help bring this thing to an end as quickly as possible. But do want you to know we are praying for you, very much so. Uh, also, I've had people asking me about their tithes and the offerings. How do they send those in? Is there a secure way to send them in? We have uh, got a uh, post office box now for our church. It's P.O. Box 6496 in Siloam Springs, Arkansas, 72761. That's P.O. Box 6496, Siloam Springs, Arkansas, 72761. Anyways, just before we turn it over to our worship team, we're going to have a word of prayer, but I do need to mention and ask that you would please be in prayer for the residents of Jonesboro, Arkansas with the tornado that swept through there yesterday. Uh, apparently a lot of devastation uh, was wrought and uh, just a lot of folks needing prayer. And we know that that's true up across the globe right now and across this great country. Uh, so please keep people in your prayers if you would. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for all that you do for us. God, we need you today. Just like we need you every other day of our life, God, and every moment of every day. Lord, we lift up those who are sick right now, those who are dealing with this virus and those dealing with other issues, ailments, God, that you would just heal them if it be thy will. Lord, show them your love, your grace right now. Make it very real to them. Be with uh, those struggling with their jobs and their situations there. Father, I pray that you would provide for them. We pray for the, the body, the family here at Calvary Baptist Church, Lord, that you would just undertake for each one. Father, let each one of our people know how much we love them, and again, more importantly, how much you love them. Bless now this time of worship, for it's in your son's precious and holy name we pray and ask. Amen. God bless you.
worship you. I thank you that you have given us this opportunity, Lord, to focus on you. And even though we feel like things aren't the way that they're supposed to be right now, you're still creator. You're still author of everything that happens in this life, Lord. I pray for those that are hurting and that just really need your peace right now, God, that you will grant them that. And I pray for all the people, Lord, that have this disease right now. Um, I pray that you remove their bodies. I pray that we will always remember the peace that passes all understanding, God, and that we will always feel your faithfulness in our life. In your name. darkness you 
give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. In grace. Welcome to our Sunday morning uh, message. It is uh, March the 29th, 2020. I have to check my computer, my calendar, just to be sure because days are starting to kind of get mixed up a little bit. We've been thrown off our game and everything's changed so much. Uh, I'm having to, uh, having to remind myself what day it is. That's awful, isn't it? Uh, hey, listen, we're praying for you. I hope you are doing well out there. Uh, if there's a need you have, if you need to pray with someone, if you need uh, help in some way, in a way that we can help you, uh, please get a hold of us at our office or contact us, text me, or send us a Facebook message. I am excited to say that uh, you can now go to our, our Calvary Baptist Church uh, website, which is calvary.love. There's no .com on the end of it, no .org or any of that. It's just calvary.love, and there is a link to our YouTube site uh, where you can watch these messages. Uh, also, you can find them on Facebook, uh, and so I want to encourage you to check them both out. We're playing around with it a little bit. We're learning as we go. I think sometimes people expect you to be a, uh, a uh, George Lucas or a Steven Spielberg when you get into, uh, into doing these things, and I promise you, we are not, okay? We're, I'm just a pastor, and so we're doing our best. appreciate your patience. appreciate you hanging in there with us. Uh, please keep praying for people as the uh, cases seem to keep growing in our area here in Oklahoma and Arkansas, um, we still have to kind of uh, uh, 
uh, recommit to abiding by the, um, the governor's wishes and the president's wishes as far as how we're meeting uh, and keeping it under 10 people. Uh, and so that's why we're, we're still doing these um, uh, video uh, messages. But anyways, I, I believe with all my heart, folks, that even though we're out of our game, even though we're out of our, our um, kind of out of our comfort zone, um, God's going to use this some way to be a blessing when this is all said and done. Uh, and we will come back stronger for it. And so let me encourage you, don't get discouraged. Uh, call people, check on folks, make sure everybody's doing well, stay in touch. I think this is an opportunity. It reminds us how important the body of Christ is. So when we do and are able to meet together, remember it's not the church building that is the body of Christ or the church. Uh, that's just the building the church meets in. And so it really reminds us of how important uh, the body is and how important the real church is. And so um, let me remind you of that, okay? Uh, let's have a word of prayer before we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for all that you do and all that you have done and your faithfulness, even in dark times and stressful times. We pray and lift up the need, uh, those that are in need right now, those who are struggling with their health, with this coronavirus or other issues too, Lord. And uh, pray for those who are, have lost their jobs or are looking at possibly losing them, have shut down shops and all kinds of things. We just lift them up to you that in this time you would, Lord, show your faithfulness and through it, Lord, draw them closer to you, Father, if they're children of God. And if they're not, if they're unbelievers, I pray that using this, Lord, you would use this as an opportunity to bring them to know Jesus Christ. Father, please bless this message, God. Uh, Lord, I know it's over uh, video, but uh, we're not in person, but, but Lord, I, I pray, God, that you would push all that aside and still use it to be a blessing to reach our people and to be an encouragement to them. Feed them with what they need today. Lord, I thank you for what you do. I thank you for allowing us this opportunity to, to still stay in touch with one another. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read to you uh, this morning from John chapter 18, verse 33 through 40. That's going to be our passage today. We're talking about the road to Calvary leads to absolute truth, uh, and we're dealing with the situation where Jesus is standing before Pilate, okay? And so as we read that passage, it says in John 18, 33, then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and he called Jesus, and he said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this of thyself, or did others tell it to thee of me? Pilate answered, saying, Am I a Jew? He said, Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? He asked him. And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into this world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, and this is what I want you to pay close attention to, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. After being mocked and tried by the religious leaders and by Caiaphas, Jesus is now brought before Pilate. Uh, why, you say? Because the religious leaders actually had no authority, really, or the right to put him to death. That had to be something done by the Romans. Plus, it fulfilled prophecy, the scripture that in the Old Testament, and particularly in the book of Psalms, that tell us how Jesus is going to die, that tells us how he's going to die, and that it would be through crucifixion, that his, his hands and his feet would be pierced. Um, nonetheless, uh, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees or of the religious leaders is on full display. For anyone that wants to study that out, and I encourage you to do so, uh, when it comes time, though, after they're done trying Jesus, and I say that w with all kind of, uh, uh, with all sarcastic meaning, all the sarcastic meaning that I can muster, when they're done trying him, uh, they pass the baton off to Pilate to finish things up. Now, Pilate normally lived in Caesarea, uh, but because of the Passover and the large number of Jews at this particular time in attendance, uh, he came to Jerusalem to keep the peace. Pilate was someone who already had had difficulties with the Jews. When he was first uh, brought in as governor, he came in with a heavy hand. That, 
didn't garner him any favor. In fact, it caused him problems in Rome as the Jews complained about him. And so you can understand that naturally Pilate didn't want anything really to do with this case. He saw this for what it was, a, a mock trial. In fact, the Bible tells us that Pilate knew that it was for envy that the Jews had brought Jesus before him. Well, that brings us to our, our message this morning, actually. As we continue down the road to Calvary, we find an interesting question that is posed here in our passage. Uh, in fact, it's said in uh, verse 38, you might say even that it's the perfect question for the cynical age in which we live today. Pilate, the Roman governor, placed over the providence of Judea, sarcastically asked Jesus, what is truth? Jesus said that he had came to bore he, he had come to bore bear witness excuse me of the truth Pilate simply said what is truth wow how ironic is it that he was standing not only in the presence of the one who would create all things that are true but who was and is the very embodiment of truth today that being Jesus Christ the bible says in John 14:6 Jesus himself said i am the way the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. John 1, I believe 17, we're reminded that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. But you know, truth is an important thing. We all agree with that. But today, uh, as one research um, study shows us, many Americans, in fact, see truth as being relative and circumstantial. Uh, in fact, two national surveys were conducted by the Barna Research Group, one amongst adults and one amongst teenagers. And they were asked, people were asked, if they believe that there are moral absolutes that are unchanging, or did they believe that moral truth is relative to our circumstances? In other words, based on how we feel, based on what we're dealing with at that particular time. This may surprise you, it may not, but by a three-to-one margin, that is 64% to 22%, Adults said truth is always relative to the person and to their situation. Can you believe that? It's always relative to the person and to their situation. The perspective was even more lopsided amongst teenagers, that being 83% of whom said moral truth depends on our circumstances. 6%, only 6% said that there is that moral truth is absolute. In other words, it's hard, fast, you can bank on it, you can count on it. Only 8% of our young people said, hey, look, we've got something out there that we can, we can set a watch to, right? You say, why is that important, Brother Wes? Why, why Pastor, why, why talk about that in this, this time of Easter and as we're getting ready for the Easter season? Um, I don't know, ask a math pack teacher, rather, who right now is doing this by video, but doing it nonetheless, trying to teach a child that two plus two equals four. Um, ask the policeman who pulls you over for speeding, did that sign really mean uh, no greater than 65, right? Uh, ask them. Ask a parent who's trying to teach their child right from wrong. What about this? Ask an unbeliever who thinks that all regions or all religions, excuse me, are true and all roads lead to heaven. Maybe ask Pilate if it were possible, who tried to hide from it when Jesus stood before him, or more accurately, as the governor himself stood before the king of kings. Ask him, is truth that important? I think if he were able to tell you today, he would say absolutely. Absolute truth is absolutely important, my friends. This morning, I simply want us to remember that truth is not an element uh, or factor that we can afford to ignore um, in any part of our life. Early on, and me being one of them, when they first started talking about this coronavirus, I, I kind of thought it would be something, and I don't mean to delineate any of these other viruses that have passed around, been passed around over the years, but H1N1 and the, or the swine flu and all these other things, they, they, they cause cr quite a bit of havoc, but Boy, nothing like this coronavirus has. So I kind of was a bit dismissive at first, like a lot of other people. I hate to admit it, but I was. Um, how, how important is it to know the truth today? Uh, if you were to ask people that are in hospital having a problem uh, struggling to breathe because they contracted this horrible virus. Um, wow, uh, truth is very important for every part of our life, especially, especially, and I want you to catch this too, for our spiritual life. In fact, as the embodiment of truth, 
uh, anyone who comes into contact with Jesus Christ has to acknowledge that a decision is needed. That's what I find interesting about this. That's true of today. If you were to mention the name Jesus, you're going to hear all kinds of ideas about him, aren't you? All kinds of opinions are going to be thrown around. You see, one thing, the one thing that people and that culture has never done is that it has never failed uh, to have an opinion about who Jesus Christ is. I, I would almost promise you, I haven't looked here lately, but I know over the last few years, anytime Easter is upon us or Christmas is upon us, um, the History Channel puts out documentaries on who the historical Jesus really is or was. Uh, and, and I can also promise you, having watched some of those, that, that they're not biblically accurate, okay? Um, so everybody has an opinion about who Jesus is. That's because he is the embodiment of truth. He is the Son of God. He is the King of Kings. And so people that came in contact with him back uh, during his earthly ministry had no other option. They had to make a decision for him or against him, right? Well, that brings me to our first couple of thoughts about both Jesus and the truth. And I think you're going to see how they how they kind of uh, coalesce, how they come together, how they how they run the same line, if you will. You see, absolute truth, first of all, is true anytime and in any place. Absolute truth is true anytime and in any place. It is a fact that can never change. For example, a circle will never be a square, and a square will never be a circle. You can try to force a square peg in a round hole all day long. It doesn't work out too well, I know, because I've tried, right? Um, absolute truth is true any place, any time. Having said that, Jesus Christ, we know Scripture tells us, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His nature hasn't changed. The fact that he loves us hasn't changed. I'm glad for that, aren't you? His promises to be with us, to supply our every need, they haven't changed either because he hasn't changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Likewise, the Bible says that he is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's what we find in Isaiah chapter 6. His nature is holy perfection, sinless perfection. That is has not changed. I want you to know that as well, my friend. Second, we see this. Absolute truth is always discovered. It is not invented. Always discovered, not invented. It kind of reminds me about Sir Isaac Newton. You see, Sir Isaac Newton, the old story goes that he was sitting under an apple tree, an apple fell out, hit him on the head, uh, and from that led to this desire to study gravity. Now, again, I, I, it's been a long time since I've read the science books, folks, but Nonetheless, I'll just say it like this, and this is very true. Sir, Sir Isaac Newton did not invent the law of gravity. He simply discovered it. In fact, he discovered something that God alone created, right? Uh, and I say that to say this. We do not invent God. We only discover him. I know that there are some people that believe in their heart and their mind that, yeah, I, I, you know, they try to fathom up a God to serve and to worship. And there are people that are atheists today, today who say that we Christians have done that, to, to use God like a crutch, that there's no such thing as a God and, uh, or, or Jesus Christ, and that we use him as a crutch. Uh, can I just remind you, friend, we don't invent God. We simply discovered him. I discovered him when I was nine years of age, or rather discovered that I could have a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. I was raised, thankfully, in a Christian family. That, that's not said of everybody I know, but uh, I discovered who God was, and I'm thankful for that. In fact, uh, the truth is this. Jesus said no one comes unto the Father unless he draws them through his Holy Spirit, through his word. We know that's how he does it. Um, but no man comes unto the Father unless he draws them. We don't invent God. We only discover him. We discover him because he makes himself known to us through his Son, Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, and through his written word. Uh, absolute truth is discovered. It's not invented. Absolute truth uh, is not absolute, or excuse me, truth that is not absolute is not truth at all. Let me say it again. Truth that is not absolute is not truth at all. If you subtract anything and add fiction to fact, to any perspective, then you cannot take that as a whole and say that is absolutely true. No, it's not, because you've got a part of it, even if it's 0.1%, that is not factual. It's not true. It's not legitimate. And I say that because we are also reminded that Jesus Christ 
is either who he said he is, did what he said he would do, or he is not. He is either who he said he was and is, and did what he said he would do, or he is not. Folks, when it comes to Jesus, we are not left the option of standing on the fence. We are not given the option of being somewhere in the middle, and I think that's where a lot of people would like to think they are, right? And we're going to get to that in a bit, but I've always liked what C.S. Lewis said about this issue. His explanation was this. He said, A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said wouldn't be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. He said, you have to make your choice. Either this was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You don't have the option, friend, of, uh, of standing in the middle, right? Absolute truth. Your truth that is not absolute is not truth at all. Fourth, absolute truth is not governed by man's opinions. You got an opinion? We all have them, don't we? A good friend of mine used to say, uh, everybody has opinions. Opinions are kind of like armpits. At least we all have at least two of them, and sometimes they stink, right? Um, I've had a few of those uh, opinions, I mean. You see, it really didn't matter what Pilate thought about Jesus, did it? It really didn't matter what the Jews even thought about Jesus. Can I tell you something today? And I don't mean this again to be harsh. If you're watching this, it really, in the end, does not matter what somebody out there in your world thinks about it or somebody watching this video thinks about him. By that, I mean this, that he will be who he is regardless of our opinions. He will come back one day, by the way, regardless of our opinions. You see, Pilate's opinion, the Jew's opinion, could not change the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and that he was going to die on the cross for our sins. I think a couple of different times and occasions throughout the ministry of Christ, I think Satan tried to step in and use different people, circumstances to stop that from happening. But Pilate couldn't stop it. The Jews couldn't stop it, right? In fact, they were rooting for it. The Jews were, that is. Pilate wanted nothing to do with it. Um, and so just, just know that, that opinions do not change absolute truth. Interestingly enough, it was Aristotle who once said, the philosopher, who said that the high-minded man must care more for the truth than what people think. That's very true, isn't it, in and of itself? Do we let the opinions of what people think about Jesus, about God, about our faith, about church, shape the way we believe and how we worship God? Or do we base everything that we do in our faith upon the truth of Scripture, what God has told us? And then finally, absolute truth will always call for action. Absolute truth will always call for absolute action. Folks, the truth is, regarding Jesus, I find it intriguing that Pilate uh, is questioning whether or not Jesus is really a king. Uh, Jesus answering, or rather, in verse 33, Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews, he asked? Jesus said, Sayest thou this of, thy, of thyself, or did others tell it of thee of me? In other words, he's wanting to know, are you really interested in this, Pilate? Now, he knows already, but he's probing him, isn't he? He's getting to his heart. Pilate, do you really care about this truth or no? Are you just asking me because someone has told you this? Pilate answered, he said, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? He said, Look, I'm, I'm not a Jewish person. I'm a Roman. Uh, your own people delivered you, so what, what's the charge here? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate answered, uh, therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Tell me. Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into this world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Friends, he presents to him very honestly two, two things here, two principles. One, that he is king, and two, that he is truth. That he is king and that he is truth. I find it intriguing because as the king of kings, as absolute truth, you and I have a choice in our life, don't we, with Jesus. We have this choice, not to stand in the middle, but we choose either to submit to him, uh, or excuse me, we choose either to believe in him or to reject him. We choose either to bow before him and to worship him or to turn our backs and walk away and worship ourselves or something else, right? 
We choose to either set the clock of our life by him or to ignore him altogether. We can either submit to him, uh, bow before him, and submit our life to his reign and to his kingship in our heart. Or know this, one day we will be judged by him. It's very serious. See, because Jesus is truth, and because truth always demands some kind of response or decision, let me quickly show you a couple of mistakes, a couple of things that came across Pilate here, and a couple of mistakes he made in responding to Jesus. As we know, he, he asks, he says, what is truth? What, what is really truth, right? Very cynical attitude, a very uh, uh, cynical way of approaching life. Four mistakes quickly and we'll be done. Number one, Pilate knew the truth and thought that he could hide from it, thought he could escape it, didn't he? You say, what are you talking about? On three different occasions, the Bible tells us that he knew that it was for envy they had delivered him. Scripture says, I am innocent. Pilate said this, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. And it also says, I have found no cause of death in him. Even his wife said, hey, listen, I've had bad dreams about this man. Have nothing to do with this just man. So Pilate knew the truth that Jesus was innocent, didn't he? And so he knew that there was something more to this whole thing. He should have at least. I think he did because you can see that in him, right? Uh, but he thought somehow, I can hide from that, right? He knew the truth. Do you know Paul told us, tells us that we of all men, all people, all people born into this world, there's nobody out there that is without excuse because we have been created to have, a, we have a conscience, uh, and we also see creation around us. In Romans 1.20, he talks about that, right? Uh, that we are without excuse there, folks. Uh, so Pilate made the mistake. He knew the truth, but he thought he could escape it. Pilate also had the opportunity to act upon the truth, but he chose not to. The second mistake he made. We see a struggle that's going on in this guy's life. I do. I'm sure you do too. Every time he goes to the Jews to meet with them, he knows this man is innocent. He knows why they've delivered him. But every time he goes, he's hoping he can do just a little bit more to get off the hook here, uh, to get Jesus off the hook and to get himself off the hook, really, right? Uh, listen, can I just be honest? That same war uh, that raged within Pilate's heart rages within the hearts of every lost person today. Every time they have the opportunity of hearing a message uh, about Jesus Christ, every time they are, are, they are uh, confronted with the reality that we're sinners and, and that if we die in our sin, we're going to a place called hell. That's, the Bible says there's only two realities outside of this earth, my friends, and that is heaven or it is hell. Two places. We didn't always exist, but we will always exist. And that is our, our souls will, our spirits, right? Uh, either in heaven or in hell. And that is the choice. It's that simple. And you say, what makes the difference, Pastor? A personal relationship with Jesus Christ does. You see, that war, that tug of war rages within the heart of every lost person. I have seen it at work when I'm sitting there preaching. It's the time of the invitation. And you know, you watch people out there and they're gripping the front of the chair in front of them or the pew in front of them and they won't let go. And you just know God's dealing with them. You feel the Holy Spirit tugging on their heart, but they don't want to go forward. They're too scared of what others think. They're too scared about giving up their sin or about this. And I, I don't know, all the thoughts, their pride maybe has entered into it. But that tug of war is happening. Pilate knew the truth, but he decided, the worst thing he could have done, he decided not to act on it. And then act, deciding not to act on it, he acted on it. And we'll see that in a second. You see, Pilate, the third point, tried to excuse himself from the decision by asking the crowd what they would have him do with Jesus. He tries to push it off on the crowd, right? And then by stating that he was washing his hands of this mess. I'm washing my hands of it. it this was because of you. I didn't want to do it, uh, but you actually made the decision. I'm just, you know, I'm following orders here, so to speak. Wow. Uh, he wanted nothing to do with Jesus. He wanted nothing to do with this decision. He thought somehow I'll remove myself from the situation and I'll place the blame on someone else's shoulders, right? that he somehow would not have to decide. My friend, can I remind you that there is absolutely no possible way that you could ever wash your hands of Jesus Christ. Even if you think that you could stand uh, uh, on the fence, you're wrong, as we already saw. We're, you are wrong. There's just no, he doesn't leave us with that option. You see, there is no such thing as fence sitting when you're dealing with absolute truth. The Bible tells us that to not accept Jesus is to actually reject him. 
You see, a lot of people, I think, think that, I, I don't have anything against Jesus. I just think that there's a lot of way to, ways to heaven or maybe don't believe in heaven or think that I, maybe I'm a good person, so God's got to let me in. I, I've just never surrendered my life to him. My friend, can I tell you, that is the same thing, according to Scripture, as rejecting him. You can look it up later in John 3, 17 and 18. To not accept Jesus Christ is to reject Christ and God's way to heaven. God's way of having a new life in him on this earth. That brings me to our last and final point. Pilate was mistaken when he thought he had passed judgment on truth, on Jesus. He was mistaken because in reality, judgment was actually passed on Pilate. The moment he allowed apathy and fear of what others thought to make up his mind, right? This idea that I don't care, uh, I don't want anything to do with this, I'm worried that my job, my life may be at stake here if these, if these folks get out of hand here in Jerusalem. Um, he was mistaken. He thought he was the one passing judgment when in reality, it's not the case. My friends, you might think you're forming an opinion about Christ when in reality, one day we will stand before him and our opinions won't matter. They'll matter not at all, actually. So I ask you, or I say this rather, Pilate represents to us today so many of the individuals who claim to have the market on their version of the truth, who claim that it does not matter what truth we live by. The truth that Pilate stood in front of that day is absolute. It's that same absolute truth that you and I stand before today. What you do with Jesus today will make the difference in how you live your life tomorrow, my friend, and not just tomorrow, for the rest of your life and on into eternity. What you do with Jesus Christ today, please hear me when I say this, if you continue to ignore him, if you continue to turn your back to him, if you continue to think you can somehow fence it and that's okay, will affect and impact you for eternity. Please hear me when I say that, that God loves you. That's why he sent his son to die for you, friend. That's why he was willing to to, to be nailed to an old rugged cross 2,000 years ago. He didn't have to do that. He didn't even have to stand before Pilate and endure the, the, the chastening, the scourging that he would endure, endure the mocking of the, of the religious people, or, or to endure the pain and suffering of, of being nailed to a cross and hung there throughout that morning that day. He didn't have to endure any of that. He chose to. The Bible says it was for love and joy the joy that was set before him. And that joy was the love he had for us and has for us and for you too. Can I tell you, friend, or ask you rather, have you accepted absolute truth into your life? Don't be one of these that says, what is truth? Don't go through life like that. It's very cynical. You don't have to. I'm not trying to give you a crutch to lean on. I'm trying to give you hope today, friend. Share hope with you. And hope has a very real name and a very real person. It, it, it exists within Jesus Christ, as we'll see for tonight's message. Would you give your life to him today? You say, how do I do that, Pastor Wes? By recognizing you're a sinner. By getting on your knees or bowing your head, however, bowing your heart. And surrender to him, saying, Lord Jesus, I know you exist. I know not only do you exist, but you're the son of God. I know you died for me and you rose again on the third day. I believe all of that. More importantly, Lord, I, I believe only you can save me. I surrender my life to you. I believe in you. You said in your word, whoever comes to you will no wise cast out. God, I'm coming to you today. I'm giving you everything. I'm turning it all over to you today. Would you do that this morning? And do this for me. If you did that, if you prayed and asked the Lord into your heart, would you let us know? Text me, message me on Facebook, or catch me at the office, or on my phone, or however you need to do it. But let us know that you gave your life to Christ. Christian, can I tell you, this has everything to do with us too, as believers, doesn't it? You say that you've accepted Jesus as the king of your life. Again, it was truth, and it was the fact that he was the king that Pilate was dealing with as your savior. We said, I, I live, I, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Can I ask you, is he more than a get-out-of-hell free card for you? Do you live by his truth on a daily life? Does your life reflect the truth of God's word? Does it do that? I promise you this, if you live by your own version of the truth, then you've built your life, your home, your family on sinking sand, just like he said in Matthew 7. You've built your life on sinking sand. Now, here's the good news. 
The good news is this, child of God, we have the truth of his word, we have his promises, and even though the storms are blowing and come upon us right now in this form of this coronavirus, people are sick, people are dying, people are losing their jobs, people are worried, uh, our, our lives have been upended. Here's the thing, the winds are blowing, the rain's falling, the lightning's crashing, but if you built your life and you're found the foundation of your faith on his truth, on Jesus Christ, you're going to be just fine. You're going to be just fine. That's my encouragement for you today. I'll simply ask you this. What are you building your life upon? What truth do you live by today? I pray it's the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you, my friend.